Welcome to Life of Neon, where we celebrate Black history, Black culture, and Black excellence through Neon art. Check out our collection at lifeofneon.com. Reparations in America and everyone who got paid. America has a long and complicated history when it comes to reparations. Since the early days of this nation, there have been a number of instances where the government has provided financial compensation to individuals who have been harmed by its actions. I know it's estimated that America's slave economy generated roughly $1.7 trillion in today's dollars. So it's no surprise that ever since the end of the Civil War, there have been calls for reparations to be paid to the descendants of slaves. And while reparations have been paid out in a number of other countries, America has yet to take this step. Tick tock, motherfucker! Nevertheless, the issue of reparations remains a hotly debated topic in America today. This is the history of reparations in America and everyone who got paid. Cherokee Nation in 1835. It's a little known fact that the first reparations payments in America were actually made to the Cherokee Nation way back in 1835. Of course, the Native Americans had been on the receiving end of plenty of unjust treatment before that, but this was the first time that any attempt was made to right those wrongs with the financial payout. The Cherokee were given $5 million as compensation for their forced relocation from their ancestral homeland in the southeastern United States. Remember the Trail of Tears? Along the way, thousands of Cherokee died from exposure, disease, and starvation. While this money was awarded to the Cherokee people, they did not have full control over it. Instead, it was placed in a trust fund managed by the U.S. government. They only ever received a fraction of that amount. And what they did receive was tightly controlled by the government, with Native Americans only allowed to use it for civilizing purposes, such as education and agriculture. It wasn't until nearly a century later that Native Americans finally won full control over their own money. Even then, it took another decade before they saw any significant payments. Unfortunately, this pattern would continue for many years, with Native Americans often being denied full control of their own land and resources. While reparations payments have been made to Native Americans, they have seldom been on the scale or with the level of autonomy that was originally promised. Special Field Order 15 On January 16, 1865, Union General William Sherman issued Special Field Order 15, which set aside 400,000 acres of land in South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida for the exclusive use of the Negroes. This order went against the wishes of President Abraham Lincoln who had been working on a more gradual plan for emancipation, which means he didn't have a plan. Nevertheless, Sherman's order helped to change the course of history, and it is still remembered as one of the most significant moments of the Civil War. The order stipulated that the land be divided into 40-acre parcels, and the order also provided for the distribution of livestock and other supplies to help the former slaves get started on their new farms. And this was the turning point of the war for the Union. The news of the order spread quickly, and by the end of the year, there were more than 10,000 freedmen living on the newly allotted land. In April, after the assassination of President Lincoln, Andrew Johnson overturned the order and took the land away from the freedmen. President Andrew Johnson issued a proclamation that returned the lands to the Southern owners. Johnson gave pardons to most former Confederates and allowed them to enact new governments. These governments, which often included previously Confederate officials, soon enacted black codes, measures designed to control and reduce the black population. General Saxton and his staff at the Charleston Freedmen Bureau refused to carry out President Johnson's wishes and denied all applications to have lands returned. In spite of this, Johnson and his allies removed General Saxton and his staff. However, Congress was able to provide legislation to assist some families in keeping their lands. Japanese Americans who were interned during World War II received $20,000 each in reparations from the U.S. government. 
as well as an apology from then-President Ronald Reagan, in 1988, Congress passed a bill authorizing payments to Japanese Americans who were interned during World War II, nearly 50 years after the war had ended. In passing the bill authorizing these payments, Congress acknowledged the fundamental injustice of the internment camps and expressed hope that such a tragedy would never be repeated. However, the internees had lost everything they owned and were forced to live in camps where conditions were often dire. So many Japanese Americans felt that the payments were inadequate. They pointed out that the internees had not only lost their liberty, but also their dignity and self-respect. Moreover, they noted that the internment had disrupted families and caused lasting psychological damage. As a result, they argued that the reparations should have been much higher. You're damn right! Tuskegee Experiment After years of campaigning and fighting for justice, the survivors of the Tuskegee Syphilis Study finally received reparations from the U.S. government in 1997. The Tuskegee Experiment was a 40-year clinical study conducted by the U.S. Public Health Service that began in 1932. The study followed 600 poor black men with syphilis who were never told they had the disease or given any treatment even after penicillin became available in 1947. As a result, many men died of the disease and hundreds more were left with permanent physical and mental damage, while their wives and children were also infected. In 1997, President Bill Clinton issued an apology to the Tuskegee survivors and their families, and Congress approved a $21 million settlement for the victims. For generations, the Tuskegee experiment has been cited as one of the most egregious examples of government-sponsored racism. But I'm sure there's more. Rosewood In Rosewood, Florida, the history of racial violence is long and bloody. In 1923, a white mob destroyed the predominantly black town, leaving dozens dead and forcing the survivors to flee for their lives. The town was home to a prosperous community of black residents, and it was known for its beautiful rosewood trees. But everything changed when a white woman accused a black man of assault. A mob of white men descended on the city, burning homes and businesses and killing residents. By the time the violence was over, nearly the entire town had been destroyed. For nearly a century, the town's residents lived with the legacy of that massacre. Until 1994, when a bill passed by the Florida legislature awarded the survivors and their descendants each $20,000 in reparations. We know, it's not nearly enough money, but it's an important step towards acknowledging the wrongs of the past and compensating the people who were victimized by them. It doesn't seem like Uncle Sam is really trying to pay enough to buy the forgiveness needed to right its wrongs. It's also clear that the government isn't really serious about fixing the issue of race relations in America. And so, well, none of us will be getting paid. Stay lit, y'all.